Good evening, everyone. I'm Claire O'Dowd. I'm research curator at the Henry Moore Institute and a very warm welcome to this evening's event. Uh, the panel discussion this evening is the first in a series of events running alongside our current exhibition, A State of Matter, Modern and Contemporary Glass Sculpture, which is on at the Institute in Leeds until June 5th. 2022 is the United Nations International Year of Glass, and so glass is being celebrated across the world in its many different forms and uses from science and technology to architecture and of course in the arts and we're really delighted that a state of matter is part of these celebrations the exhibition explores the many different ways that artists have worked with glass which is not necessarily a material that's immediately associated with sculpture However, I've been working on this exhibition for two years now, and I've learned during that time what an incredible material it is. It is full of creative possibilities, and sculptors have been using glass for decades now to produce some truly innovative and thought-provoking work. Now, I received a number of warnings when I first started along this path, uh, not warnings about the conceptual or practical difficulties of doing an exhibition about glass, nor were there any warnings about sculptures being particularly fragile or vulnerable, which I was surprised to find is not the case. Uh, no, I was warned that it might result in an obsession, and those people were right. I'm sure that the seductive nature of glass as a material for sculpture will come up during our discussions this evening. So the exhibition looks at glass through the three states of matter, solid, liquid and gas. And these roughly, very roughly, correspond to particular techniques such as casting and moulding or blown glass or poured molten glass. Sometimes the artists in the exhibition have worked with the common properties of glass and sometimes they've challenged them or have subverted our expectations of what glass is and what it can do. Our three guests this evening all approach working with glass in very different ways and with very different but very spectacular results. And I'm delighted that we have been able to include their work in the exhibition and also that they're able to join us tonight to tell us more about it. So I'd like to introduce our three speakers for this evening. Uh, our first guest this evening is Luke Jerram. Uh, Luke's multidisciplinary practice involves the creation of sculptures, installations and live arts projects. Luke is based in the UK but has been working internationally since 1997. Uh, in the last 25 years he's created a number of extraordinary art projects including his Museum of the Moon which has now been shown in more than 30, project, uh, 30 countries and his project Gaia, which is a seven metre diameter scale representation of the Earth, which is currently touring the UK and abroad. And I think, I can, is that what I can see behind your head, Luke? Yeah. <laughs> Many of Luke's artworks are in permanent collections, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the Wellcome Collection in London. In 2020, Luke was given an honorary doctorate from the University of Bristol, made an honorary academician of the RWA and a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. And we have three sculptures from Luke's glass microbiology series on show in the exhibition. Uh, we have HIV, we have malaria, uh, and we have hand, foot and mouth. Our second panelist is Elliot Walker. Elliot began his practice in 2007 as a hobbyist creating stained glass windows. He originally started out studying psychology and was awarded his degree from Bangor University, but subsequently trained in glass making and design at Dudley College of Technology. Elliot went on to gain an MA from the University of Wolverhampton before spending eight years working at London Glass Blowing with Peter Layton. In 2021, Elliot won the Netflix glass, blow, glass blowing competition, Blown Away. Elliot's work is based around traditional glass making techniques, including sculpting in molten glass, known as the Marcello technique, which he uses to develop his personal sculptural language. And we're currently showing Elliot's sculpture spillage as part of the exhibition. Our third speaker is Emma Wuffenden. Emma is trained in glass making and experiments extensively with glass making techniques. She studied in Farnham from 1981 to 84 and then at the Royal College of Art from 1992 to 1993. 
1994, Emma received a Crafts Council grant to establish a glass studio, and in 1997, she was awarded the Arts Foundation Fellowship. Emma exhibits and lectures internationally, and her work is represented in more than 25 public collections across the US and Europe, including the Victoria and Albert, the Wellcome Trust and the Crafts Council Collection in London, the National Museum of Scotland, Shanghai Glass Museum and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And Emma's sculpture Creature is currently on display in a state of matter. So thank you all very, very much for joining us this evening. Um, to begin with, uh, I'd like to go back, if we can, to first principles and ask um, an obvious but very important question. Why glass? <laughs> what, what does glass allow you all to do or say as sculptors that other materials don't? Um, Emma, can I pick on you first to come in on that oh. one and tell us? <laughs> yeah, oh, well, if I'm entirely honest, the, um, you know, my initial uh, introduction to glass was, was quite arbitrary because I, I had some experience with ceramics um, and I really just knew nothing about glass. And when I saw it on a form, I, I ticked the box, but, uh, you know, I did stay with it and discovered a lot of things I was interested in. So, um, but I think there was one, this one idea or how I imagined uh, glass was just sheet glass really. And I, I, I imagined, associated it with buildings. <laughs> um, and I'd never seen glass being made, but I knew, so I, I was choosing it really because I, I didn't know anything about it. So, um, but I've stuck with it because it, it started to, um, you know, provide me with a lot of uh, ideas and associations. And well, I work very much with, you know, across materials um, using glass making. And it, for me, it's been about the transferable skills that once you know how to make something in glass, you, you can transfer it into many materials, into wax. If I'm, if I'm making a, a mold, I can also make a, a mold that's suitable, you know, to press clay into, to pour wax into, to make a fiberglass piece. So, um, but the actual qualities of, of glass, um, I, I always think there's something about the emptiness of it and also the excitement of it and those sort of two things together um for me are very powerful so yeah that's a really interesting way of describing it the em the idea of emptiness is something that i think comes across certainly in your work with the way that you mm. use blown glass um can we show an image of emma's creature because i think it's such a a good example of how this emptiness works is there, is there anything that glass allows you to do that other materials don't because there's i think this sculpture would be very different it would, if it were made in a different material well it's immediately it's it's very otherworldly glass and i think i'm very you know right from the beginning um the shape the shapes that glass make always interested me. So the, the bubble um, as an elemental form, you know, something I've used, you know, across all the years I've been working with glass. And um, and I think because, especially with this piece, it's, um, it's, ta it's talking about being both very disembodied, but very embodied at the same time. And I, I, I've just really been thinking about that um, since the piece is being exhibited with with you guys, um, maybe because of some of your descriptions or reactions to it as well. Um, yeah, so I would say um, absolutely you can't make this. Um, you, you wouldn't get the same, but it, the same um, meaning or communication. Um, so yeah and i think also if you if you're a glass maker you, you start to work with the fact that the thicker glass full of refraction is very fleshy it can be very fleshy 
Um, whereas if you're working with um, flamework glass, you get this sort of in very, very much uh, this very even quality, which I've got in the other, the lamp work piece, who will have the power to do what to whom. So you can see the difference. And sometimes I always wanted things to look very manufactured. Um, and then at other times, you know, more handmade, I suppose, or with sort of um, a richer quality in a way. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I think the the, the different qualities of different glass making techniques are really interesting as well. Luke, can I come to you? Because your work uses, in some ways, the those those properties of lampwork glass and that that precision that it allows. How, how did you come to, to work in glass in this way? What was it that, that drew you to, to producing these works in glass? Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm actually colorblind. So I've got a, that colorblindness has given me a sort of natural interest in visual perception. And back in uh, 2004, I, um, I was interested in sort of images of viruses. And I was going through a newspaper and found out quite quickly that these viruses, you know, you see in a newspaper an image of, of say, HIV uh, in a newspaper to help illustrate a pandemic. And, um, and I found out quite quickly that, that these images of viruses have been sort of artificially coloured. You'd have an electron microscope image of a virus and then scientists or journalists would add colour. And those colours add a, an emotional um, content to it. So you end up with these sort of scary looking yellow and purple looking viruses, whereas those colors are, they're artificial. And, and viruses are actually smaller than the wavelength of light itself. So they don't really have any color. And that's the reason I started making these. I made a small HIV sculpture, which looked quite similar to this one on the screen, about the size of a cricket ball um, back in 2004, as a sort of alternative transparent um, alternative representation of the virus, a three-dimensional version of it. Uh, and so you end up, yeah, you remove the colour from it, but you end up, because it's made in glass, you end up with these incredibly beautiful objects. So there's suddenly this tension that arises between the beauty of the object and then what it represents, which are, you know, these deadly viruses and pathogens. Uh, and uh, that initial work was made, yeah, was acquired by the Welcome Collection, and it, it led to this large body of work, which we've been working on now for over over fifteen years now, something like that. So it's um, yeah, it sort of got a bit out of hand. There's something nice about about glass in that you know, if they, if these were made of plastic, there would be a sort of cheap optical quality about them. But whereas if they're made in glass, they're cold to touch, which is very nice. There's something very precious about it as well. There's a sort of preciousness, a sort of jewel-like quality, which you wouldn't really get in any other material. No, that's so true. And when they're, when they're lit like this and you can see the detail in them and so on, there is something very kind of precious about them. And the, the disjuncture as well between these absolutely hideous diseases like foot and mouth and malaria and things and that, that, that when they're rendered in glass they they become these absolutely beautiful precious objects it's quite striking yeah i did have a letter from someone suffering from hiv and he said well thank you for for illustrating the virus that's inside my body the virus that may end up killing me it's good to see the enemy within to see what it actually looks like uh, and over 15 years, we've had to change our models slowly to reflect contemporary scientific understanding as well. So that's been quite interesting. And the, the, the imagery of these viruses, the photographs of these sculptures have become part of the language of virology. So they get used in medical books and textbooks all around the world as well. So what, what I quite like about art, when I make artwork, you're never entirely sure where, what the, what the impact of something will be. And, where an artwork will end up. So the fact that they get used in medical books, you know, you couldn't have kind of predicted that perhaps when you initially had the idea. Um, so that's why one of the reasons I like making art because you can end up with all these unusual outcomes. That's very true. Elliot, can we come to you and 
find out yeah. what sure. are you going to do in glass because um, <laughs> it, it's not an obvious choice no it's not <laughs> really <laughs> um, and and it wasn't it wasn't my first choice um well this this part of the process wasn't my first choice working at the furnace so uh when i finished my psychology degree i was really interested in uh working as a sculptor and working with glass because i'd already started sort of exploring the material itself anyway but i wanted to work in um in casting so lost wax style kiln work i was very into sculpting with wax sculpting with clay at the time um and the first time i saw glass blowing itself i didn't want anything to do with it i mean someone set themselves on fire someone burned themselves and it was just like really chaotic and there was loads of people and i didn't want anything to do with it at all um but as you sort of said in the introduction you do get addicted um to to the material and especially when it's molten there's no there's no other material for sculpture that that acts like like molten glass um and i guess for me it's it's the the, the sort of symbiosis that that occurs when a maker is producing um a piece that's fresh from the furnace i mean you're your body is a massive part of the the process and every sort of movement that you make affects the piece that you're creating and a lot of the um the sort of uh, material knowledge comes from um muscle memory and knowing how to work with the glass and react to the glass as it's moving so it's a very sort of symbiotic relationship uh, more than i think any other material and that's the other part of it that i like um the fact that it's a very sort of virtuosic material, even though you're forced to work with other people, you have to work with other people to create something of, of any sort of complexity. Um, but the, the material itself doesn't rely on anything else. Um, so to the, the, the space that the pieces are occupying are, they don't exist until your hands and your tools create them in, in this sort of like void and they sort of fill the space but you don't need anything to constrict it as in like a mold or a former or you know you don't need to make uh, a negative or a positive you can just sculpt directly in the material and then by the time you finish the sculpture it's basically finished you know and that's that sort of immediacy and working with a single material is what I um, was sort of interested in the start because I'm, I'm sort of quite a practically minded person and I've basically spent the last sort of uh, eight to sort of 11 years skilling myself um, in this material. I mean, the apprenticeships used to be about seven years and that was to be able to blow a bubble of glass into a mold and make like a vase shape. So, you know, I feel like I'm coming to the end of my training at the moment and now I'm starting my next journey as, as an artist and figuring out the sort of work that I want to make to express myself. Up till now, I've been reacting um, to things that I've seen and I've been exploring art history through my work because I've never had any formal training in the arts. So I'm at the point now where I'm starting to um, figure out where I am and, and the work that I'm going to be making. I'm in the middle of like a big shift at the minute in what I'm creating. Where does this piece sit in that shift? Uh, it sits. It sits in like a sort of random offshoot somewhere, like over there. <laughs> uh, I tend to sort of change what I'm doing all the time um, and sort of explore different avenues. And because I've had such um, unlimited access to the material and to the equipment you need to 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 create something like this, you know, I've been able to just spread all over the place. <laughs> and so, like this piece is sort of. It's sort of part of my exploration of still life. It's a little bit part of, um, you know, sort of human interactions with objects, which I feel like I'm doing every day. You know, I'm interacting with these run of the mill objects that I'm creating and I'm trying to sort of understand them and understand my place and their place in the world. So this is sort of part of that as well. But in terms of like something that will be recreated again, it's never going to happen, you know, because I'm already on to the next thing and sort of, you know, uh, spreading into a different area. Can we talk a bit about personal practice and, and the ways in which you all develop work? And Elliot, I, I need to ask you this because I know that that one of our attendees is incredibly curious and actually how you made this particular piece is one of the questions that 
that keeps coming up. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit more about how, not just how you developed it, but also the, the, the technique that you've used? Because the question that, that people are asking about this piece most is, how did you get the red bit inside? How did I get the red bit <laughs> inside? I mean, everything that I, that I do um, is based on, on a traditional technique, a technique that has been around since people started making glass um, for the most part. So this would, I guess it would be called like Sommerso or Incalmo if you wanted to do the Italian sort of version. It's like a, it's a bit of both. So a Sommerso is where you're sort of dipping one piece of glass into another color and sort of coating it or creating like a layer. And an Incalmo is where you're attaching two different colored elements together. Um, and it, it, and there's nothing different about about this piece. You know, I'm I, it's those techniques. So you're basically fusing two different colors of glass together at different angles. And once you've done that, you then decide on your form. Obviously, there's a lot of planning that goes into it to make it the right sort of level and the right proportions and stuff. But it's using the the techniques that have been around you know, for, for hundreds of years, really, it's, it's quite, you know, it's, I'd say the technique is run of the mill. <laughs> <laughs> it's not coming across that way at all. Um, it, it comes across as, as a puzzle. It's, a, it's genuinely puzzling. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's, there's, how, the, how there's always happens. a certain magic in, in glass making itself. And I think like with all sort of magic, once you learn how it's done and you see it done, you know part of it can be killed but i'm always trying to do something slightly different with the techniques that i'm using um and can i ask emma as well how do you get from the thing in your head to the thing that we look at in the exhibition how what, what's your how do you personally develop well, the thing in the, the the piece in the exhibition is actually all the blown elements are made by James Maskery at the National Glass Centre. So I would have taken him a, um, a scale drawing and um, probably just a charcoal drawing um, with all the sort of shapes quite clearly defined within the figure. Um, and then, um, you know, he, he would blow the elements and then I would take them away and cut and grind and construct them. So, so quite often if I'm in a situation, sometimes I'm in the situation of a symposium or, um, or it, you know, in a factory and um, it's a very limited time. And what, you know, one example might be um, recently in Sweden, they had a lot of molds actually. So I was able to go to the, into the museum, identify the shapes I wanted, go to the um, mold making, um, cupboard which was a bit like a museum that you know had one mold from 1800 and something you know and one from the 60s and then I took tracings of them and built the figure by using those shapes and then I would take those shapes some of those shapes home again to back to my studio in London and then maybe alter the shape by adding something um, and then take another mold so I'm really moving a lot between um, mold making and drawing and and the process so but early on i mean i absolutely love glass blowing and i get very jealous when i watch people making glass blowing but i knew that um i couldn't really um you know very early on i couldn't sort of have the breadth of palette i needed somehow and if I if I took it all if I tried to build a glass blowing studio, especially in the eighties and the, the money it would take, as as well. I mean, it's still a really you you have to commit everything as as Elliot would know <laughs> firsthand, and um, but it's still um, it is very um, as you as you spoke about. It's very addictive, and every time I get a chance, I do. Um, go to the furnace and and um, and uh, and you know really miss it actually and um, because I think there's that direct thing of which I, I always had with clay and I used, I still have it with other mediums but it's a very intimate thing as well it's sort of it's something in your head it's in in your hands and you you're modeling it and there's something um, 
yeah, very special about that. Um, so what, what I tended to do was, you know, I went for, you know, got involved in a lot of kiln forming. So um, there's, I put some images in um, of slumped and constructed pieces, the first two images. There's a piece called Bud on a Chair. Um, and then there's also uh, the one um, with the, the ropes that's tied. Yeah, yeah. And I put it in because really, um, it, it's 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 a it's a process that uh, in the night, which I sort of started working with in the '90s. So it it was a way of um, uh, you know, basically, I could form glass in the kiln that looks slightly. It's it, 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 in a way, it looks blown. It looks inflated. It's it's made um, in two parts, and then you know, it's formed in a kiln, cut and joined. So, pros, you know, things like that. Um, and then the next image after that. Um, oh no, back actually, back one. It's there's a little cast bubble called probe. Um, Again, you'll see that that's a solid casting, but it's taken the outside shape is 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 taken from a glass um, blown shape. This sort of slumping and constructing, I don't know. I mean, it, probably people, you know, other people do it. I suppose it's sort of related to vacuum forming in some way. But um, I tend, you know, I tended to get interested and develop a way of making something and um and then move on quite quickly um mm. because i get you know i'd get interested in the next thing or i'd find a quality in the glass that i wanted to explore and yeah. i think with the with the kind of window glass um you know it's uh it, again it's a sort of um it's very cheap to buy for a start and um, it has yeah. a very different quality. Yeah, I didn't realise that that's how this piece was made. It's a bit tricky because you're only seeing it from the angle. Yeah. Right. yeah. From one from one side it is three dimensional. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, and I, I think I was always interested in trying to make objects um, you know attach themselves to the real world <laughs> so i was often trying to you know make tableaus of, or attach them to the architecture or yeah to make things feel more alive or human or activate them in some way i suppose yeah mm. yeah that that the simple act of tying that to a chair <laughs> it's it's become something completely different it does something completely completely different and um, luke can i ask you this, the same question about how you develop your work in fact this would be a good a good point to show the film art that we have of your work from drawing to lamp working yeah i've been lucky enough actually over the years to do to, yeah, I offer, yeah, I, I'm not a glass blower, I should say, very, but I've, I collaborate with, with glass blowers, uh, both near Bristol, where I'm living, but I've done residences and um, uh, in America and yeah, up at the National Glass Centre, there's a glass team there. So I've got a sense of, um, I've learned all the, technically, learn, you know, I know what's possible in terms of the skills and the methods and of, of both lamp work, the sort of flame work glass, but also hot glass. So what you're seeing here, these are, um, initially you've got a, a screen full of, oh, it's all a bit glitchy on mine, a screen full of um, electron microscope imagery. And this is, um, this is Norman, Brian and Norman up at the National Glass Centre, and they specialise in, um, in lamp work. And it's made of borosilicate glass, which is the type of glass used to make distilleries and test tubes. So it's sort of scientific glassware. And these guys are trained over 30 years um, to do sort of scientific glassware. The nice thing about this type of glassware is it's incredibly accurate. 
So I can send a drawing and they can make something, you know, with all the diagrams and measurements and they'll, they can make it sort of millimeter perfect. Whereas hot glass, uh, the sort of glass that's done where you start off with molten glass is, um, can be, I, I always find it quite restrictive really. Uh, in fact, all glass making is really restrictive. There's a, you know, it's, it's very, um, there's only a sort of specific number of kind of methods that you can use. And there's only a specific size that you can make, uh, you know, something got, if it's on a, a punty, you know, you've got to have a glass blow. It's got to be able to lift the thing. It's got to be able to go in a kiln. Uh, it's got to be flashed, heated. It's got to be annealed, all, all those sorts of things. They limit what's possible. And for me, I, I find it quite frustrating sometimes. So sometimes when you go to a glass exhibition, you know, you'll see all the, all the artworks are the same kind of size, or they're all made and they're all sort of, symmetrical in one axis where they've been put in a kiln and they go round and round you know uh, to be able to to, to go into the um, um yeah the furnace so it's um but anyway what you're seeing here you can see my drawings on the right hand side and norman is busy he's making a protein that goes on the outside of this um uh this, this virus sculpture and they're all made by hand and you start off with yeah, rods of cold borosilicate glass and you're melting them. So it's quite a specific uh, process. Um, and then all those components then get fused onto the outside of this, the sphere, this sort of bubble uh, sculpture. Um, but it's been really nice. It's been a really nice collaboration. And one of the comments in the, um, in the, in the chat below was whether uh, the idea of glass blowing, it's sort of whether it takes a, it disrupts the sense of genius that you get from, uh, you know, the idea of an individual artist working in their own in a garret. You know, whereas glass blowing is is very very um, collaborative in its nature. You know, you have to work as a team, even if you are an individual glass blower, you're going to struggle to 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 run a workshop if you're only on your own. So these are some of the glass artworks that are made. Um, and gradually over 10, 15 years, the artworks have got more and more complicated. And I'm sort of, we've been pushing the boundaries of, of glass blowing. It's a bit like ceramics in, in, in that you can, you can spend, you know, hours and hours on something and then you put it in the kiln to anneal it and it sort of smashes into a million pieces. It can explode or implode or arrive back cracked. So it is very tem temperamental. Um, and yeah, really I mean, that, that's great. something that somebody somebody's just asked in the um, in the chat about the volatility of glass and your relationships with it, which is a really interesting question. I so think that's part of the addiction to it. It's like a gambling addiction. You're asking, yeah. <laughs> you know, the perfect win. But yeah. it makes it really tense when you're working, which I really is something I don't like as well. <laughs> Do you find that really stressful then when you're making it really stressful yeah. Don't know yeah whether that's gonna work out or not yeah 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 or even it's just natural. shipping these artworks around the world can be a complete yeah. nightmare you know i've got these little, tell me about that <laughs> i get these sort of boxes back from america that are a bit smaller than they were when they went out yeah, there and they're really yeah. rackly yeah yeah, and yeah. You think, oh god it's a, you know another one that's gone and it's yeah it's, it can be a real headache um or i loan one of these artworks out and for a film crew to, and it comes back in a rattly box and it's just a film cameraman who's just nudged it with his elbow and the whole thing's sort of shattered into a gazillion pieces on the floor mm. it's very much an all or nothing uh, sort of material in that way <laughs> it is a bit and but you know do you, <laughs> the, the question is do you simply get cross if something breaks like what what do you do i mean you've you've spent you've poured everything into a piece and spent hours on it and then something when, when you try and when you start sort of working with um sort of very very complicated forms um it's such a common occurrence that you you, you know there's no way you can avoid it you know you have to you have to be able to deal with it and learn to deal with it i mean it's changed me as a person um quite massively i mean <laughs> you know you have to uh you have to sort of um detach yourself from the piece while while you're making it because you know there's a very good chance that it won't it won't it won't make it to the end you know it won't it won't finish the process so if you end up getting stressed uh it makes it more likely you know 
um, as soon as you get that sort of little bit of fear and you, you know your hands start going and you know you're so close to the end and you just want to rush the last part of the process that's when it all goes wrong so you have to really sort of detach yourself and be sort of very cool headed and um, you know uh, unemotional which is a really difficult thing to do when you've been working for like five hours in the extreme heat arguing with your assistants or whoever's there and like dealing with all the problems you know it's hard to do and it does it does change you and it does get to you quite a lot so what what kind of relationships do you have with the material then this is a really interesting question because on the one hand if you're making something out of clay for example you have a really direct relationship with the material i think you still do yeah i mean i i sort of um the, the main reason why it's such a difficult thing to learn is because it's resting state isn't anything that you could interact with very easily. You know, I mean, the resting state of a piece of clay is a lump of clay and I could give it to you now and say, make a dog and you could sort of make a dog ish. You know, if I give you a bit of molten glass and say, there's your puddle, get on with it. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be really hard to even start. So your relationship starts really quickly and, um, you know, you have, and it's the symbiosis again, you have to, you have to give everything to it. And then you find out that it really, you know, the material doesn't want to be what you want it to be. And it's a constant sort of battle. Uh, my relationship has now warped into like, uh, I'm sort of subservient and I beg it and, and convince it to do what I want to <laughs> do, you know? <laughs> So you have to be quite humble with it if you really want it to work and to sort of show you what it's capable of. I, I devise some some ways of working where I can sort of, because it's constructed, I can replace parts, but also I have made pieces that when they have shattered, I've just re-glued them and then they're broken again and I've re kept re-gluing them as a kind of aesthetic. So. Um, so I have got, there's one piece, uh, Shattered Swing Figure. I don't have it, I have it on my web, website, which is just re-glued, re you know, and it is just made of lots of shattered glass. Um, and Luke, the, what's your relationship with the material like? If, um, in that sense, do you, do you how, how invested are you and how, how attached are you to the, this this the finished product and the the vulnerability of it who's that to <laughs> luke sorry oh no, sorry yeah no i'm i'm really not in i i just find it, it's a useful material so basically the idea the artworks i make are very much sort of ideas driven so um you know i had an idea to to deliver music to affect people's dreams at six in the morning you know the idea of sculpting in dream space which i thought was quite cool and then i bumped into a hot air balloonist and i thought that'd be about right so we would strap speakers onto hot air balloons and fly over cities to affect people's dreams in the early morning sculpt to sculpt their imaginations by playing music down into people's bedrooms so and that project's called the Sky Orchestra and it's sort of toured for 10 years. But basically you start off with a concept and something you really want to do and deliver. And then you choose a medium and a technique in order to deliver that concept. So if I, if I want to you know, affect people's dreams, uh, I'll use sound and hot air balloons as a delivery mechanism. If I want to visualize uh, viruses, uh, I might use glass, um, uh, you know, I. I will work with a hot air balloon manufacturer if I want to create a replica moon. So basically, and it's through collaboration that, that, that anything is possible. Um, and what I really enjoy doing is collaborating with different manufacturers and having those, I can sit down and have those really interesting conversations about sort of joining mechanisms and methods of, of fabrication. And every different manufacturer I work with, whether it's for jewellery or glass blowing or hot air balloon manufacturing, they all have their own different language of, of um, and methods and processes. And that's my job as an artist is to learn the language of all these different processes so that I can go to a, a woodworker or a carver and I say, look, can you use this particular tool and method for this process? And I sort of get off on that. And, and what it means is also I, I'm not... I'm not going to invest 20 years of my life learning how to 
blow glass. I mean, that's the other thing. I, I have found a number of glass artists and they, they literally spend 20 years doing, you know, investing all the money and the time and everything. And in some respects, it can actually compress and, and focus and shorten and, and limit what they're, what they're able to do because they spent all this time on one material. And so it prevents them from doing a bit of, you know, uh, designing a big metal sculpture over there or doing a sound installation over there. But you know, that's my personal preference. I mean, that's the interesting part, thing about this exhibition, I think. I mean, because you have people from all these different, um, you know, uh, points of view and ways of working in this in this same material. You know, I'm very much on the opposite sort of scale um, to, to what Luke was saying there, where my interest is in, has been in the, um, you know, the material knowledge and, you know, the, the idea of like dipping in and out of, of different materials at this point for me, I'm so um, mentally invested in the process itself that I can't really, um, you know, envision a time where I would completely move away from glass because it's like, it's the thing that I've, um, it's the material that suits me best. I don't, I, I sort of, I do agree a little bit with the limitations of that, but there's, I think there's, um, because it's so difficult to learn, a lot of people get to a certain point and then they stop or they get to a certain point they think this is making me money enough to carry on and i'll continue in that vein um i'm very much new to this in a lot of ways you know i'm very sort of early stages in what i'm doing but my sort of outlook on it is similar to luke with the idea that you want to be able to expand your concept and you want to make work within a certain um you know using these conceptual um uh like areas that you want to investigate but through glass itself i think it can be done and i think you can have an awful lot of scope within a single material yeah um, you know i think it's a bit of a mistake to think that because you make things that you don't have a concept before you start but it's also um a really different way of working that you know luke's is working in an incredibly different way but i think um you know, I, I'm very interested in the sort of function of making, you know, what does it do to you? What, what, what can it do to you? How can it change you? How can it change your perception, your relationship to other concrete things? You know, how can it change your, your brain, actually? You know, how, what, what can it do for people? And I think that's something I'm really interested in, in connection to making. Mm. And um, it's quite an insular thing, you know, it is, and it's like a little bit self-obsessive. You know um so I, I agree with that side of it you know you're always looking inward and you have this one material that's sort of taken over all of your thought processes but i think that all, all of your thought processes but i do think there's um you know there's a lot of scope if you can really sort of push yourself to to explore it which, which I, I i think a lot of people who work with glass as a, as a material specific thing they don't they get to a point and then they just sort of stop you know and they stick at one level yeah, I think that there is a sense in some cases that you feel like people have reached a kind of comfortable level with it and they're in a comfort zone and that it you doesn't... You never have that with glass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it, it's not necessarily a comfortable material to work with, I think. And we're getting loads and loads of questions and thank you everybody for um, putting all of your questions into the chat. Um, we've had a couple of questions that have, have come in about techniques and funding. Um, we've got a question for Luke about your virus series um, and the tradition of Blaschka glass models and the way they materialized the natural sciences in the 19th century, which is a brilliant question because the, that, that relationship is is really lovely between the kind of history of, of um, like natural science models and what you're doing today. Um, can you say a bit more about about? That? Yeah, so the the Blaschka brothers was a sort of dynasty of glass blowers, uh, maybe 100 years ago, maybe 150 years ago, and they used glass to make micro uh, sort of representations, glass models, absolutely beautiful of um, radiolarians under, under the sea kind of creatures, microscopic organisms, um, you know, squids and all these sort of amazing stuff. 
And what's interesting, this is all before plastic was kind of invented. So they were either going to make it in glass or or not, you know, that or they supposedly make it out of wood, but glass was sort of perfect. But um, they ended up with a kind of catalog of about 5,000 things that they would make that they could make. Um, and it's some of the best glass blowing ever produced. I mean, it's extraordinary stuff. But yeah, at the time, they were literally visualizing objects that would be beyond perception. So presumably, like a fisherman would pull out something, this sort of gloopy, sludgy stuff. Someone would do a drawing of it, perhaps, or that uh, sample would get sent to the Blaschkas and they would then make a representation of it and help visualize it, something that hadn't really been seen or understood before. Um, and I suppose the work with this glass microbiology series that we've been doing over the last 15 years is, is along a similar vein in that when I started doing this work, viruses were these, you had a sort of chemical model and then you had a kind of grainy electron microscope model. And, it, and then you had to sort of, scientists had to sort of work out what was going on between the two. And they'd often do sort of scientific drawings and diagrams. So there was a place for, for these glass viruses to help illustrate um, what viruses actually look like, which are these sort of transparent, um, beautiful geometric forms, I suppose. So there, there is a lovely relationship and, and about sort of visualizing the invisible. Yeah, that is a lovely way of putting it. Um, I love Blaschka's work, the Blaschka brothers work. We've shown it at the Institute before and there's, there's just mind blowing the kind of things they were producing 150 years ago, just so, so gorgeous. Um, there's another question that's come in about cold work and that is going to everybody, I think. How much does cold work play a role in your practice? And uh, how much do you all use it? Um, I mean, I use it quite a lot at the moment. I think it's uh, it's like a necessary evil, <laughs> really. Um, I mean, some people get really into it as a technique um, and you know, base a lot of their work solely upon that, that, that process. Um, I sort of use it as uh, a means to an end. You know, you have to, you have to finish stuff. Yeah, it, I was thinking it is a kind of means to an end. Uh, but I quite enjoyed. I took some glass objects and put them through a, a sandblaster to get them sort of eaten away. I like the idea of a, a glass that has been sort of um, eaten away, almost like by a virus. You know, this was inspired by a J.G. Ballard book all about glass but um yeah i generally i mean i often use we use glass um the cold work as a way of sort of finishing tidying things up um there's a bit of that that goes on it's the bit that you do at the end to sort of tidy things up and deal with nasty breaks and um things like that but it as you as you it doesn't have to be that way it can be the main tool for uh, making artworks mm, i haven't really I don't, I've done a lot of cold work, um, but it's not particularly visible because, you know, some people use cold work to create optical qualities. Um, they use it very specifically and then, um, but the type of cold work I do is, as you know, is to kind of cut or grind away the bits I don't need to enable me to put the other bits together or grinding angles so that it's not or else to polish castings. So I'm literally, when you cast something in a, in a mold um, using lost wax casting process, there's a huge amount of cold work to go from that surface through to a transparent surface. Yeah, uh, I've, got, I've got here a, um, this is a sculpture of, of COVID-19. Uh, so this is what's been turning the world upside down for the last sort of couple of years. We've been making these and then selling them, raising money for Medicine Sans Frontier. But the inside has been sandblasted. I don't know if you can see that. And it's just a way of sort of differentiating between the inside and the outside and making it more visible. Um, some, some, you know, exhibiting glass is an artwork in itself. You have to, it has to be really well lit. And I remember I loaned some of these to uh, some gallery in New York, a museum of design in New York. And I was horrified because they'd exhibited it on a white background like that, and lit it on a white background. It just sort of disappeared. It was a complete nightmare. So the lighting, the presentation of, of glass is, is almost as important as the object itself a lot of the time. 
Yes, you don't need to tell me that. <laughs> You've done a great job, I should hasten to add. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, I have to say that the plinth for those three works is one of the most complicated pieces of machinery we've oh, ever had to put sorry. But yeah, I, it worked, though. It worked really well. I know, actually, that is a, an interesting question because we were wrestling with that with Creature as well, Emma. Um, yeah. And how to, because it is completely clear with the white, kind of edges and stuff and and mm. how to make that show up effectively without just kind of painting the walls behind it but actually there's something for that piece there's something quite compelling about walking around it and having it periodically disappear and then reappear again against the background it, it's quite ethereal the way that that the way that that works in the gallery and it has this kind of outline that shows up occasionally yeah in full and then kind of you see it in full yeah. and it's it's really quite a it, it's yeah. a really quite effective piece in that sense of like the way it, the way it, it can yeah. merge it's, from its background it's actually something which really frustrates me as not being able to you know because i actually quite like defined you know seeing a lot of definition and um, I quite often, you know, work in solid material, you know, solid mm. non-transparent material, but um, I find it very frustrating um, that, uh, yeah, that, that it, you know, not being able to see glass. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think I think you you can see it though, and I think there's something about with the creature and with the the nature of the piece. There's something really interesting about that in the gallery space and and what that actually does when you move around it and so on. And it it kind of it makes it even more sort of unnerving in some ways. And there yeah, are I noticed we didn't go for shadows or um... yeah. And that there, there are certain angles where you get to see everything. And if you don't, if, if you hadn't spotted it in the images of creature, it has very, very obvious genitalia, but they're only obvious from certain directions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's really kind of otherworldly in the gallery. I actually really love the way that that's turned out. Um, actually, Elliot, I was going to ask you about this as well. And somebody else has, has kind of touched on this in the chat, but your piece has such a distinct outline like emma's doesn't it? it has this very ethereal quality to it but yours has got a very it looks like it's been drawn rather than yeah i mean that was that was part of that i mean as i said that piece was sort of like um you know it's off on its own in a lot of ways um in the work that i'm doing but because i spent the last sort of four years working in this um you know exploring still life for myself as well um, you know, sort of educating myself in still life and basically learning the skills, I guess, of uh, a painter. You know, I'm learning about composition, I'm learning about um, form and texture and light and all these sorts of things. So that piece itself was, was the next, you know, exploring this idea of having this 2D form that's brought 3D and how I can use the glass and use different types of texture to sort of accentuate that. Um, but the work that the still life work that I'm sort of moving into at the minute is all based on clear um, glass. I think we've got a couple of, of pictures. Oh yeah, can you see some of this? Yeah, so I mean, the, there's, there is like, you know, a tendency, I think, as someone who's, um, who's learning the skill, you get like obsessed with color technique. You know and i'm always trying to like push back a little bit on my natural and sort of curious curiosity that's built through the material of like just learning how to do all the color techniques learning how to put trails on and do cane work and do miller fury and all this sort of stuff so um yeah it's um you know working stripping it all back and working with clear you can really sort of um so it's not this image it's the one of the yeah so and then there's one of the fish which i think looks a bit better yeah. Yeah, so, you know, building these compositions all in clear and then using this, yeah, that one, using this sort of dichroic um, transfer and this concrete to sort of uh, really push this this contrast. And this piece as well, as you, it's really difficult to photograph, I think it's possible to photograph, but as you move around it, the colour gets sucked up into the piece and the fish suddenly looks like 
beautiful and incredible and then you change your angle and it all disappears again so i guess with with these i was sort of thinking about the perspective aspect of um of still life as well and the way it's sort of transitory and um you know a lot of these um you know bountiful constructions are done uh, and then taken apart really quickly so the idea of its sort of transitions was was quite interesting for me but then the pre the preservation of it as well because obviously uh, you know these these forms as long as they're not dropped will sort of last indefinitely so it's like this idea of preservation and perspective and you know I'm basically like learning all of these different things that I guess you'd go to art school for <laughs> but I'm having to do it like off my own back really. I think that the influence that you can see in these and that that idea of borrowing from you know old masters and the, the, the Dutch still lives and all that kind of thing then and like bringing our history into it in that way is really interesting are there, are there any other uh, kind of influences and stuff at work i'm really interested in where everyone's been influenced and what you're what you're what you draw on generally well, i think in general i mean i i have spent these past sort of eight years skilling myself so i can produce the work that i want to produce um and because you know i went from education to um, like a practical education straight into work because I wanted to um, learn the skills. And so I've spent the last eight years doing that. And I'm now at the point where um, I'm starting to uh, make work for myself rather than as uh, an education thing for myself or, or, or reacting to things that I've seen. So for me, that story is yet to sort of really happen. <laughs> And um, Luca, we've, we've spoken about the Blaschka brothers, um, but are there any other influences at work in the glass microbiology series? That's a good point. Um, I suppose I'm interested in the, the, the communication of, for this body of work anyway, I'm interested in the communication of science. Um, and yeah, the the language of science and how it's communicated and how images of science get yeah presented to the public and how they're interpreted i suppose i suppose I, I i i do i used to really hate history at school and um and i realized it's they often used to teach sort of history of kings and queens and all that sort of stuff i'm not interested in kings and queens i, I suppose i've got a real passion for the int and, and an interest in history of science um, you know, all these beautiful illustrations from the sort of 17th century. Um, yeah, I'm interested in the, the history of science and I suppose a lot of these, this work, this body of work in particular, is sort of inspired by that. I try, I try to make artwork that will be relevant in 50 or 100 years time, you know, and I think um, I'm hoping that some of these artworks will still be around then. They'll be in, snuck away in museums, a bit like the Blaschka brothers, and they'll still have a relevance and they'll still um, have some sort of value perhaps in a hundred years time. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things I do. And I also try to make work that has multiple points of access. So if you're, a, a, um, you know, if you're trained in virology, you're going to appreciate these artworks in one way. Whereas if you're just, a, or if you're a glass blower uh, or uh, just a member of the public interested in art, you know, you're going to appreciate them in a different, different way. So having artworks with multiple doors of entry for me is quite important. Right. And uh, Emma, uh, what kind of influences are at work in your work? Um, well, you know, obviously I'm very interested in, you know, hu the human, human sensations and psychology and um yeah i think yeah recently definitely you know thinking about this idea of maybe how you know what what is going on um uh you know when you when you make things how how is that how does that function um and what what are we what are we actually doing and i, I actually i interesting that um luke mentioned uh, dreams because I, I i'm very interested in in those connections um between dream states and how actually how important dreaming is in terms of communicating um so not literally dreaming the object but really the process of 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 combining and collaging um maybe what happened today 
uh, with something that happened, uh, you know, 30 years ago and how that kind of can come together and sort of tell you something about what's going on around you and how you're experiencing that. But I think um, during COVID, I've been involved um, with a group of uh, female artists from around the world. And we sort of had the opportunity to just put something uh, online. We have a page, it's called The Crown Letter. Um, and we also meet over Zoom. And they're, they're mainly filmmakers and photographers. Well, they're artists who use filmmaking and photography, photography mainly. So it sort of made me think a lot about the relationship between sculpture and, and, and the digital. Um, and when you exhibit sculpture, how inaccessible that can be. And actually, if you have a film next to it of yourself interacting or someone interacting or the thing you know, uh, doing something that people tend to really be drawn to the, the film rather than the object. And I, I find I've been thinking about those sorts of things. I, I, they're not really influences, but also just, I just um, just finished uh, Margaret Atwood's, um, the McAdams Mac uh, trilogy, which is, you know, this post-apocalyptic, um, series um and yeah so i've been thinking a lot uh yeah about you know the usefulness of 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 making actually because that's all about people who survive um so, uh, so yeah lots uh, i suppose yeah books um yeah, the, the idea of dreams is really interesting because I think that your work definitely has that quality that it's a kind of... Yeah, I think it's just that... Um, object. I, I often wonder if you're not accessing the same, the same sort of things when you're making a, a work, um, you know, that's, that somehow you're putting together um sometimes quite opposing things and then you suddenly arrive at something and it's oh it's a bit of a revelation i didn't realize i was thinking about that or worrying about that or you know or experiencing that yeah i think it's quite a functional thing <laughs> yeah but, yeah and art making often is i think yeah that's and, yeah, absolutely. Um, we had a question that I, I want to jump onto uh, in the chat, and um, it's about the use of fossil fuels and sustainable sources of heat in glass making. Um, is it is it possible to work with glass using sustainable sources of heat? Speaking of apocalypses. <laughs> at the minute I mean you know I'm just in the in the process of setting up a, a studio and we're very much reliant on um, industry technology you know that's where all the um, investment is all the um, interest is in developing new technologies because that's where all the money is that's where all the money is being spent and invested there's like a trickle down effect and has been since the studio glass movement started where we utilize little aspects of industry shrink it down to like a human scale and then and then be able to to make and use the material um at the minute there's been there's been a recent um firing i think in in pilkington in st helens where they they did a, a float glass melt with um hydrogen uh, with a hydrogen fuel which was really interesting i mean it's going to be about you know 10 years before any of that sort of technology is trickling down um to to sort of make as if there are any left by that point <laughs> but uh, yeah so at the moment i mean for my my practice itself there's there's no way of avoiding um the use of of natural gas and electricity that's made made by natural gas because you need such high temperatures to be able to work it i mean i have strategies in place now that i'm in control of my own studio space to uh you know glass is infinitely recyclable so um, closing that loop and getting rid of any waste from the studio is, is one way of doing it. And then making our own colour 
um, so we can switch off the furnace for you know four to five months during the year and then use the color that we've made ourselves to then um, do uh, some like cast work and, and other types of, of sculpture with glass as well but it all takes energy it's all energy intensive it is a really energy intensive process mm -hmm. there's no avoiding that um luke can i ask you because your your gaia project at the moment is you know it's about the earth and how we see the earth and so on um does that have any bearing on on the kind of processes that you use at all yeah it does i mean um i think 2019 i had 117 exhibitions in about 20 countries around the world i mean it's nuts i worked out my carbon footprint and it was not good uh because yeah we're shipping all these artworks around and then often shipping technicians around as well to help oversee the installation and or install these artworks and actually the pandemic has been quite good in that it's forced me um to yeah reduce that it, the number of flights we're doing right down which is great so now i'm you know i did an install earlier today uh in boston but i did it via zoom so um you know a lot of these installs all the indoor ones of these giant artworks are are done remotely um and i've now got sort of technicians so i've got technicians in australia and in america where they they live there locally but we've trained them up on how to install these artworks um on on my behalf so i don't have to fly to australia so um i think we all need to do, we need all need to do what we can to reduce our carbon footprint and we need to um, there is a it's a real state of emergency i think with this climate um crisis and i i i think if you're a lawyer or a banker or you're a um an artist or a designer i think we can all we all have these amazing skills and we all have to do what we can to help deal with the climate crisis and as an artist what i can do is i can make strong arresting imagery um and make people sort of value our planet perhaps in some ways but as well as the kind of communication of the climate crisis um i'm trying to reduce my carbon footprint as well but it's it's very tricky isn't it i think as artists as makers yeah. because whatever we do um we're going to be using for you know uh, resources of some sort um, the nice thing about these artworks that I've got back here, these inflatable giant artworks, is they are they're reusable. So an artwork might get presented 40 or 50 times before it, the end of its life. Um, and now I'm trying to work out, you know, how to recycle uh, the fabric right, once it's been, um, once it's come to the end of its life. But I, yeah, I'm trying to think that through very, very carefully. Um, and it's a, it's a difficult one. It's a, it's a difficult one yeah it really is and it's difficult for us uh, kind of on the other end of that in galleries as well because we want to show amazing things and we want to show mm. you know fabulous work from around the world but actually getting it around the world and and yeah well it all has to be done slowly i think that's the thing instead of flying these artworks yeah, around, it needs to be done, done slowly by, and shipped over you know yeah yeah there is definitely Sorry. Sorry, horse drawn car. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I'd love to see the contents of a glass exhibition arriving in Leeds. On well, a I mean, car. yeah, I mean, there's the canals you see as well. I mean, that's quite, you know, for, for in the UK, the canals are an amazing way of like moving stuff around, you know. Yeah, and for glass, probably safer than horse drawn car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I'm, I design artworks and then they get manufactured in other countries where they're going to be exhibited. And certainly for large artworks, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, all, you know, I, I do a load of CAD drawings and models, and then I send those out digitally to a fabricator based in uh, Seoul in South Korea for them to manufacture something on my behalf, which I can sort of oversee. It's a different, different way of doing something, but as a way of reducing the carbon footprint it does it does work yeah i think as well bringing it like um round again to the, the sort of glass thing i mean i think for, for me um the days of of um artists sort of 
banging out a load of work and you know using a load of glass and having the furnaces blaring on all the time I mean I think those days are sort of finished and, and yeah, for, the, for think... the good really as well it's like you know I try and really consider what I'm making I don't work at the furnace all day I'll make one piece and then everything sort of um, shut down or held in stasis while I finish that piece off so I think if you're more sensitive with the way you make things and what you're populating the world with then it's it, it's a it's a better thing to do straight away yeah i mean make less and make it better and yeah i mean yeah i mean though i i also worked a lot uh just with bottles be just because at different different points um you know just challenging the fact that I might have all these skills and 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 be able to do a six week car firing and annealing schedule but you know maybe I can say the same thing with 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 very little or or with practically nothing and I think that's a challenge I mean maybe um and that's something I became very interested in actually just making things out of a few few bits and pieces rather than a huge um, process. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, I also in the 90s um, produced this tableware um, out of bottles called Transglass. And that, that, that was produced in, eventually in Guatemala City, but in the end, you know, the, the shipping of that is, is, is is not very green it was not green so i mean uh then we started to think about you know producing locally and maybe you know giving those designs to people who can just make them on the spot and sell them locally and that's a much better format for that for that tableware yeah thank you for those insights that was really interesting um i think actually as well that is probably um a good note to end on like the the kind of ways forward for glass making and studio practices um and i think also we have managed to get through all of the the questions in the chat so thank you all for um some really really great questions yeah. so I'd like to end uh, this evening by thanking our three amazing guests to Elliot Walker, Emma Wolfenden and Luke Jerram. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and a reminder that you can see their work at the moment at the Henry Moore Institute in the State of Matter exhibition until June the 5th. And uh, please join us again for the next event in this series on Wednesday 30th of March at six o'clock when we'll be joined by Dr Caroline McCaffrey Howarth who is curator of 17th and 18th century ceramics at the VNA and Caroline will be talking about the role of glass in the age of enlightenment which is the period when uh, Britain began to overtake Venice as the global leader in glass making so a very interesting period in history but that's it from us tonight, I think. So thank you so much to Emma and Elliot and Luke. It's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you for your insights. Thank you to everybody watching for your questions and comments. And it's a good night from all of us. Thanks for being a great host. It's been wonderful. Nice to yeah, meet you all. Thank you. Take care. Thank you all.